You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Ready to stand out, Army ROTC prepares you not only as a college student, but as a strong leader, allowing you to earn the rank of second lieutenant. You will be eligible for full tuition, merit-based scholarships, and develop leadership skills essential for your future. Start strong and enhance your college experience. Visit your campus Army ROTC representative today. To find out how you can earn up to a full tuition scholarship, visit GoArmy.com slash podcast to locate your closest ROTC program today. Army officers inspire strength in others. Paid for by the United States Army. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gay, so when I'm coming to see you, see you. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm. But even then, he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. 
Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. The following program contains coarse language and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, I guess I'll do the intro. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to He Said, She Said, the show that's supposed to be Aggies, but she fell asleep with the switch again. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> I was listening to the music, and I was like, man, that is so cool. And I was waiting for our music, the ska music that I normally listen to. <laughs> well, no, well, no, if I was, was going to do that, I would have done that in the beginning with the record scratch, but we do that all the time, so I just figured I'd do this. Uh, oh, that's okay. Welcome to another episode of He Said, She Said. I am Aggie, and with me is our beloved producer, Rick. There, is that better? <laughs> at, least that, at least now it feels a little more normal. I mean, you know, I, I, already, I already threw a curveball because I was like, well, we're not doing a regular intro since we're doing like ghost stories and stuff tonight, so I'm going to find something else. And then I was like, I'll just do that. Yeah, right. that'll work. And then, right. It yeah. was a good It was a good intro. I just messed it up for everybody because well, that's well, what I do. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you haven't been doing this for like three years or anything. Have I been doing it that long? Oh, my word. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'm about to mess up once I, every two weeks. Cause it's I, fine. Because I've been divorced for almost three years, and I know you've been doing this for longer than I've been divorced. So. Right. This is true. This is true. I can mess up every two weeks. It's fine. That's all right. <laughs> Wait, nobody I don't, cares. I don't remember seeing that in your contract. Where does it say in your contract that you're allowed to mess up? Uh, paragraph A, subset C. I think it was. I don't know. Somewhere yeah. in there. It's next to the green M and M bowl. Oh, so you're the one that wants the green ones. <laughs> I do not actually. <laughs> she gets on my nerves. The green M and M does. Anyway, moving on. Well, I mean, you know, still we're still Halloween ish. We're talking candy, so you know, you can. You can that's true. You that's true. Um, and it's funny because that was a you know one of the copy pastas that were go that was going around today was favorite candy that is not chocolate, you know, and, and so mine was caramel, which I'm a sucker for, too. So it's chocolate, caramel, and then space, 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 space every other candy. Nice. I, I think it was actually this show. Um, remember when we played the the band the the Eminem commercial that isn't allowed to be played in the states? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was kind of eye opening. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just again them saying the quiet part out loud, and everybody thinking it's a joke. And. It, and <laughs> They would, they would actually make more money with that commercial. 
<laughs> well, the funny thing is, it can air almost everywhere but here. It's banned right. here. It, it can air in it can air in Europe. It can air pretty much anywhere else, but it just can't ban here. And I have a, I, I can't air here. And I have a feeling that's because they would be like, "Oh shit, somebody said the quiet part out loud again." Probably, probably. It, it was pretty epic. <laughs> A commercial and i was just like wow yeah so i so, can't believe somebody made that <laughs> so if you guys missed it it's it's the purple the almond m M&M m with the yellow peanut m M&M, m and it cuts to the the kind the pan, can't camera kind of pans out and it's it's the yellow m M&M m with nothing inside it anymore and she's wiping her wiping her mouth with a napkin and she's like so now i get to be in the commercial right he's like i said maybe <laughs> <laughs> It was pretty funny. Oh my god! Oh my god! That I don't know. Who, they did not pay that guy enough. I bet. I I know they didn't pay that guy enough to do that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so are you are you uh, are you ready for Halloween? I mean, have you bought your stash of candy and everything? Oh yeah. Have? I I well we don't. There, I live in the country, so we don't get kids. So, but but I have like a full weekend of stuff planned. Like, we're doing the uh, this the entire city of Moore puts on a trick or treat thing that they usually do on Saturdays that starts at four. So we're going to be doing that tomorrow, and then my church is doing trunk or treat on Monday, and then there's full on you know Halloween night on I think it's like Tuesday. Um, yeah, it's Tuesday. So yeah, Gracie's going to have more candy than she knows what to do with. And Papa was smart. I went to Walmart earlier and bought myself one of the really big bags, and it's already in my room for later. <laughs> <laughs> I had, um, I bought candy yesterday. I went to the grocery store and bought some, you know, a couple of the big bags, but I also bought a lot of the full size candy bars. And I'm doing trunk or treat on Monday. Um, over at the, I think it, we're having it at the elementary school this year. So the big bags are reserved. The, the, the full size candy bars go first. And then the big bags are reserved in case I run out. And I'm, I'm praying that I run out of everything because I don't want to take candy back home with me. I can't. <laughs> What I might do is box it all up and mail it to my sister so that she can give it to her grandchildren. Let them be hopped up on sugar. That'd be fine. Oh, great. Then she'll have a house full of kids going, I am Cornholio. I need TP for my bunghole. <laughs> That's her problem, not mine. <laughs> but you'll be the one getting the hate phone calls. <laughs> yeah, she's she's already starting with the scary shit, too. So she sent me pictures of how she set up all of the um, Halloween decorations and everything. And she changed the light bulb outside to be red, you know, and uh, so she's lined up um, red lights alongside the, the driveway. So that when kids come up, you know, it looks like, you know, the path to hell or something. I don't know. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, it's funny now that your kids are gone and have families of their own, you get more involved with Halloween. Why didn't you do this when you had kids? When they could enjoy it. And she said, I didn't want to do anything for them. They drove me nuts. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So she does this now because she's got grandchildren. <laughs> I mean, if she really wants to make her walkway look like the entryway to hell, she, just, she should just make it look like a wedding aisle. Oof. Just saying. <laughs> I... <laughs> well, that's... And, and, and in other news... <laughs> Bitter party of Rick, your table's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, she's, you know, they have... Um, the it, it's kind of like I think they're LEDs that you can change the color so that's what she has set up so she can change the color so she'll leave them set up and then come you know after after Thanksgiving she'll put the uh, the more colorful and put them on like a you know sequence 
dancing lights or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But for now, they're just solid red. So I'm like, okay, that 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 describes your house to T. So that's okay. I didn't say that to her because I know it would come back to bite my ass. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever, you know, flicks are big. So I, you know, living way out here, I no longer feel the need to decorate for Halloween. So I ended up giving away all my Halloween decorations. I donated them to, <laughs> to a local um, Goodwill, you know, and I, I drive up there and my entire, the entire back of my pathfinder is full of Halloween stuff, <laughs> like houses and, you know, the carved out pumpkins and all this stuff. And, and they're like, but Halloween is coming. I was like, yeah, but I live so far out. I don't even bother with decorating my house. Nobody can find me anyway. So what's the point? So somebody got lucky and got some really nice decorations <laughs> last year. <laughs> Yeah, now that I have so many grandkids, I'm actually thinking about maybe starting to decorate, probably starting next year. It's just been such a pain getting, I mean, when you're with somebody for 20 years, it takes forever to get everything completely separated and severed, and it just feels like it's a never-ending thing. And everyone's like, well, why haven't you started redecorating the house or anything yet? I'm like, because by the time I deal with all the crap I have to do within a day, plus all the things that I'm trying to build, I don't really feel like doing anything. They're like, well, you'd probably feel It's better. not a priority. It really isn't. It's not a priority. But you know what? If you need anything for decorating, hit me up. Because it's probably here in my house just <laughs> waiting to be donated. <laughs> I got tables. I got chairs. I got all sorts of stuff. So Nice. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> but yeah, so I feel kind of bad because I I like Halloween. I like dressing up every year. But living out here, I no longer have the need to do so. So that's why I'm doing, that's why I do trunk or treat now because it gives me the opportunity to dress up in my costume at least and then, you know, put it away or give it away. I I'm actually mailing my sister all my old costumes so that she can wear them since she's going to be going through you know, Halloween. She really wants the <laughs> Tippy Hedren, the birds costume. She thought that was cool and she needs that in her life. So I was like, yeah, I'll send it to you. <laughs> you do have some pretty creative Halloween costumes, I have to admit. I I try. I try to make a pun out of my costume every year or an homage to a classic thing that we've seen on TV or in a movie or whatever, you know. So, like, um, my last year's costume was, you know, a TIE fighter. But (laughs) so many people didn't get it until I actually said it was a TIE fighter. (laughs) And they were like, oh, my God, that's an awful pun. I got it. I was laughing. (laughs) I I thought it was great. And I'd had that idea since, you know, I went to a a sci-fi con in Houston, God, years and years and years ago. So I finally got around to doing it. And now this year's is going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to be epic. <laughs> if I do say so myself. <laughs> yeah, I It's going to be very unexpected. I can tell you that. <laughs> I remember last week when you were like, I think I may even stop dressing up. And everybody was like, no. <laughs> I got yelled at. <laughs> I got yelled at. I actually, I was in a, um, conversation with my sisters because you know one of my sister now lives in in germany they're stationed over there and then i have one that lives near san antonio and another one lives near me and you know i was telling well nobody comes out here so i think i'm i'm, I'm gonna stop doing the whole dressing up for halloween i, I get back everybody was screaming like caps lock you can't do that. You can't quit. You got to keep going. My God, what are you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, why are you yelling at me? <laughs> I said I was thinking about it. I, that's all. I'm kind of like married to it now. I'm going to have to like keep going. Even if I never show it to anybody outside of the house, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> uh, 
once you, it's like I told you last week, once you start a tradition, you're stuck with it. Yeah, so I, I did get a really cool idea from a friend of mine. It, she wants me to do a take on villains, like a, a whole series. And I'm like, oh, that should be kind of cool. So oh, I got to I gotta pick some villains and, and then tweak the costumes to be more punny than anything. That should be fun. So I am now. So next year's is gonna be different. So I'm now anxiously awaiting your Angela Lansbury pun. <laughs> oh man, I do want to dress up like Angela Lansbury, but she had such an extensive career, and she didn't really have a a set like costume look, unless you look at some of the period stuff that she did. Um, and those are too intensive. Even, even doing, uh, Sweeney Todd would be like, most people still wouldn't get it. (laughs) But if I, if I wear a typewriter with my, you know, and a cup of tea and the, the, the blonde, the, the reddish blonde wig, maybe people will get it. Oh yeah, that might work. So that might work. (laughs) I, so you're doing drug or drink. Are you going to be dressing up too? Uh, probably not this year. I didn't really have an opportunity to get a costume for myself. So you got to work with what you got in your in your in your closet. Yeah, I don't really have anything in my closet though. <laughs> I mean the the last time I the last time I dressed up dressed up for Halloween was when we did a haunted house, and that was all the way back when we lived in Midwest City. We turned our house and backyard into a haunted house. For Whoa. The kids. Um, and that seriously was, yeah that was forever ago i don't yeah i mean halloween's always been like fun for me but not like that kind of fun for me i'm always more into like thanksgiving and christmas and all my friends are like i want to put up a halloween tree and i want to do this and i want to do that i'm like i just want to go to bed <laughs> yeah i don't yeah i don't do christmas tree is, is i'll do a christmas tree but I don't do the, the Easter egg tree. I don't do the Halloween tree, which happens to be very kitschy right now. I don't do 4th of July trees unless I do a red, white, and blue tree for Christmas. Then, you know, that's that's pretty much as far. But the only tree decorating that I do is during Christmas. Yeah. I just, I, it's too much work. I have a... And my sister, my sister's favorite her favorite um, holiday is Easter. Her entire house looks like she threw up <laughs> pastel <laughs> sprinkles everywhere. I mean, That's seriously, nice. it's all pastels. You walk in and you're like, just, I can't, I can't stay here. <laughs> she must have at least a hundred bunnies throughout the house. And that's just the first floor. Oh my God. It's just, it's insane. She goes really, really. But she has those little Christmas tree that for hanging eggs. And I'm like, no, that's just too much. So does, I, does, does Fu know that your sister is kidnapping her family? No, no, I, I, I better not say anything because I'm afraid. <laughs> to be fair, she treats the, she treats those, those, uh, all of the bunnies really, really well. I mean, she packs them away in tissue paper so that they don't get dusty or anything. And she puts them all in boxes or, or you know, those Rubbermaid containers and all that stuff. And she puts them away really nicely and everything. So she's really anal about that. <laughs> 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 but uh, I, 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 I don't do the... You know, I, I saw somebody doing a really cool um, black Christmas tree with Halloween decorations on it. And, and I was like, yeah, I have, yeah, I have, I have no. a friend that does that. I But but I mean, I literally I have a friend that literally has like a Christmas tree for pretty much every holiday. Um, they have a white Christmas tree that they decorate in red, white and blue for Fourth of July. They have a black one that they deck out in scary crap for Halloween. They, they have uh, then at Christmas time, they have like three trees for different parts of their house i'm like y'all are just nuts <laughs> mm, no i do i do multiple christmas trees in the uh in my house this is true and i got that from my mother because my mom had the big christmas tree in the den and then she had the little show tree 
in the front window in the formal living area. And then every bedroom had to have their own little Christmas tree. And she had to have one on the dining room table and on the breakfast table. And then she puts miniature ones in the bathrooms. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why do you need them in the bathrooms? I don't understand. And, you know, she basically told me to go to hell when I questioned it. But anyway. <laughs> it makes people feel festive when they're stuck on the pot, Aggie. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but it's it's so ridiculous. She just, but, you know, she loves Christmas. And her favorite, um, her favorite song is 12 Days of Christmas. So I have been collecting the Hallmark ornaments. Um you know, for 12 years <laughs> so I can gift them to her this year. And oh, nice. that way she has a complete set. And she's, cause she's never had a complete set. She has, she has plates, she has mugs, she has cookie tins. She's got, um, uh, decoration. I say 12 days, you know, or whatever. And, but she doesn't have a set of ornaments. So I'm giving them to her this year. And she's going to be like, well, where did you get these from? I don't know. It says Hallmark right there. <laughs> oh, come on, Mike. Every, everybody goes as the devil for Halloween. You can't do that. Uh, I don't know. Well, no. He said, know. he said he was going as Nick Saban, so I just pointed out that everybody goes, <laughs> every, everybody goes as the devil for Halloween. So you got to find something else. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, a friend of mine got dressed as an IRS auditor for did, um did they for live? a Halloween party. Did they live? <laughs> it was pretty funny. This was last weekend. They had their you know their Halloween party or something, and he dressed up as an IRS auditor, <laughs> and he just wore a suit tie. He had a little fedora, and sticking out of it was um, like a like a tack, like a receipt, you know, from it was sticking out of the brim, and then um, he had uh, a name tag, and you know, said IRS on it, and he walked around with a um, one of those calculators. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny. He said it was really, he just got stuff out of his closet, and that's that was the you know he remembered having that that the the ad, adding calculator that you that you bring up you know you you pull down and so he he went he it was a big hit some people didn't like it gee i can't imagine why but it was a big hit that's why my <laughs> first question was did he make it home alive yeah oh that that's a that's a good one <laughs> i think one of my favorites my my girlfriend she just could not think of something to wear for her. She was hosting a Halloween party for her daughter, who um, uh, was about 14, 15 years old at the time. So she invited some of us to go and 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 uh, help to chaperone and all that stuff. And we're there, and I'm I'm dressed as a woodland fairy, and she looks at me and says, "Man, I, I, you." you have the cutest costumes and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I look at her and she's wearing a sweatshirt and black slacks. But the sweatshirt has crosses on it. She took multicolored tape, she took different rolls of tape in different colors and made different colored crosses all over it. And I'm like, what are you supposed to be? She says, I'm a cross-dresser. I'm like, oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't think of anything and it just hit her that she said that's what I'm going to be and that's what she was she was a cross dresser and it was it was sublime because most people are like I don't know I don't understand it I don't get it I don't get it and she was really good because she did all of the crosses in different colors <laughs> it wasn't just you know but um, it, it was pretty cool it was pretty cool I gotta say so, yeah. I would have done that this year, but I had a better idea. So, <laughs> and let's face it, nowadays if you put something like that on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, you'll you're, get canceled. You're gonna get nuked. So you really can't do it anymore. <laughs> you're gonna get nuked. 
So yeah, now they're posting costumes in chat. Uh, one of them that that was actually pretty cool. <laughs> it's, a, it's a picture of a ghost, ghost costume, and it says, "Had a great time tonight." Me too. You free Friday? Ghosted. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, that has happened. But luckily for me, it happened well before before we had texts and everything. Happened live and in person where they just kind of like, yeah, I don't know you. <laughs> Shoot, it, it happened to me. Like I drove hours to meet somebody that I've been speaking to online. So she lived, she lived in Ohio. And of course, I live in Oklahoma. So we decided to meet in the middle. Um and then we spent a weekend kind of hanging out, and then I texted her on my way home, and then she went to go hang out with her parents for like a week. Never heard from her again. I texted her when she got home. Hey, did you at least make it home okay? Never responded. So I finally just sent her and said, obviously, we're looking for different stuff, so see ya. <laughs> yeah. Amazing to me that people do that. I mean, they're not even courteous enough to tell you that yeah this is not going to work out or you know i think we want two different things blah 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 blah. at least have the courage to face them and tell them that's a kindness in itself you know to ghost them is really unkind it's cowardly and and it it amazes me i mean i've known people that have friends and everything and suddenly you know they're just not talking anymore and they're like, I don't know what I did. And I'm like, I couldn't tell you. But it's kind of weird when they just go silent and they don't tell you, you know, that, uh, you know, things. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm off in this direction, you know, and all that stuff or whatever, for whatever reason. It's, you know, it's kinder to actually tell the person that you're not interested or there is too much going on in your life and you're just not in a place where you can date or you know do anything you know whatever to go somebody is just so cowardly i mean i i guess i guess i have a type because i basically got ghosted from my divorce too <laughs> she she basically, <laughs> basically left never came back and then called me and told me we were getting divorced oh uh, okay then she was definitely a coward <laughs> couldn't face you so yeah i, I, I mean I, that's the way i see it i think it's just a cowardly action when when they don't you know tell you when they ghost you or ignore you or you know after years of treating you like a friend then you're just yeah we're done here and they don't they're gone and, and i don't like Okay, I get that your life took on a different direction or whatever, but at least have the courtesy to tell me that it did. Because, you know, you, you're left with this guilt, like, what did I do wrong? And if, if chances are 95% of the time you didn't do anything wrong. Nothing wrong happened, but, you know, you guys just didn't mesh well or whatever, you know, whatever reason. In your case, obviously she did everything wrong, but... That's just my bias <laughs> talking. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I wasn't perfect either, but I damn sure would have never done that to her. Just saying. No, no, I'm just like, um, I mean, we all know the story with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and the chat in three, Steve that two, lives in one, infamy here on the internet. Steve. <laughs> But, you know, I when I was in college and we did the whole bonfire buddies thing and everything, he was not the only, you know, blind date that I had due to bonfire buddies and all that stuff. I did have one where we decided to meet and everything and we got along great. It was fine. We had, I mean, it was like, we got, I mean, it was like our brains were the same and everything. And, and, uh, we were laughing at jokes and doing fun stuff and everything. And, you know, at the end of the night, you know, he walked me back to my, my dorm and said good night. And then he walked back to his. And like two days later, he called me up and said, Hey, can I, can I come over? I need to talk to you. 
And yeah, I said, sure. Yeah, I'm in between classes. My next class is not for two hours, so I got time. And so he came over and and I was like, what's something wrong? He's like, I don't want to lead you on. I was like, what? (laughs) He's like, I know this sounds kind of weird. We got along really, really well, but I really don't want to date anybody right now. And even though you're fun, I don't really, I didn't feel that date connection anyway. So I just wanted to clear that up before it went, before you thought or something would happen to make you think that it could go further or whatever. And I just, I don't want to, I don't want to do that to you. That was a kindness. That was, I, you know, I was kind of like taken aback for a second. And then I realized what he was doing. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate that you were honest enough to tell me that this is not something you wanted in your life at the moment. That's fine. Believe it or not, we're still friends. (laughs) And, And so, you know, we remain friends in college. We remain friends after college, you know, found each other again on social media and, you know, are still good friends, you know, and, and, um, his wife is a lovely person and I get it. it, She and I are the same kind of person too. So, you know, we all share the same jokes. We're all always laughing at everything, but that was, to me, that was a kindness that he did because he did not want to raise my hopes. He didn't want to make me believe that this could go somewhere. You know, and he wanted to make sure that I understood where he was coming from and where he was going. And for the life of me, I just don't understand. Ghosting to me is just so rude (laughs) and mean and cowardly. You know, it's just I I hate it. I, I couldn't do that to anybody. I just I just couldn't. But I'm just rambling. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking we really need to start doing merchandise because we should really put together a, a shirt with Chat Lives Matter on the back, and <laughs> right. And fuck Steve. No, no. no <laughs> I, I was, I was gonna flip it a little bit. I was gonna make it stuck thief. <laughs> stuck thief. <laughs> oh man, that is that. That's hilarious. Uh, well, Ordy's in chat, so I guess he's available now to join us. I, he should have had a link, but I'll try to add him. Hang on. Yeah, angry Skype noises. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi, guys. How you doing? Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I am well. <laughs> So, but, how was work? Are we a commercial or are we live? No, we're live. We're live. Uh, work was fucking exhausting. <laughs> but, but it's a beautiful day, so. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. It rained all day today here. So I went outside to start, you know, finish sanding those tables, and the humidity was killing me. I just you mean could not stripping? Huh? huh? Stripping? No, no, no. no, no. Sanding. Okay. Uh, I already stripped. Hot. <laughs> giggity, giggity. Giggity goo. Stick around. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, it's, it, it was 30 degrees this morning, but it turned out to be a lovely day, and I was working up in the mountains, so. I'm sorry, you said 30? It started out at 30, and then it ended up at 69, I think. Giggity. Um, giggity. <laughs> so this is the time of year where we get wild variant temperature swings, like, 40, 50 degree temperature swings. It's like tomorrow yeah. morning is supposed to be 25. And yeah, then next we're, week we're, we're in back in the 80s. Next yeah. Next week we're going to be getting 25. Yeah, 25 to 85. I think I think so. we're like 34 tomorrow morning and then 60. So yeah, we're, we're kind of getting to that time of year too, unfortunately. Um, so before News we... and traffic on the threes. Weather coming up. KRN Radio. Com. So before we before we get into the official ghost stories, I have the scariest one ever. Okay, go. The zombie in the White House. You know what the scariest part is? We're all living it right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> Been waiting all day oh. for that one. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Clips. <clears throat> 
Monkey shines. <laughs> See, I can't even say that. What's that? Because I uh, monkey shines on on X because somebody will say that I'm being racist, and I'm like, why is this racist? <laughs> Seriously, see, and you see, but you see that yeah, without getting too much into politics, um, which is funny because anybody who sees like any reference to monkey ape or anything like that having to deal with a black person, that's their own prejudice. That's not that's their own racism because that's their go to. You know, it's right. like you, monkeys actually do exist outside of character cartoons. Correct. So, I've seen them. I've been to the zoo. I I I used to. Um... That we had one at Texas A&M, a chimpanzee, actually. And I used to go and volunteer time so that I could work with her. And she was the cutest thing. And, and she, wore, she wore dresses. It was, it was adorable. <laughs> but chimpanzees are evil. <laughs> Just going to put that right out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody, you know, mischaracterizes... Um, Gorillas as being the very bloodthirsty, um, evil primate. And that is absolutely not true. Gorillas are very tame, very gentle. I'm sorry. I've seen Congo. You're full of shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're vegetarian. They're, you know, that kind of, they do. The silverback male will challenge. This is true. And they can be hostile. Don't get me wrong. But they don't commit cannibalism, okay? They don't kill for sport. And they don't turn on, on, their, on their own kin. So all I'm saying is be careful with chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so our topic tonight is our favorite ghost stories. Yes. Which, which we've covered before, but they're always fun. And I'm not kidding you right now. Every single light in this room is on. Every single one, including the nightlight. <laughs> two lamps, a nightlight, and the overheads. There's two overheads. <laughs> it's like you're watching The Exorcist or some shit. <laughs> I, saw, I saw the funniest, the funniest screenshot, and somebody posted it in a meme group. And it was about the movie The Thing. And the guy's, the guy's talking about it, and it's like a Reddit post or something. He's like, I'm going to go watch The Thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up with a better name than that because that is just ridiculous. And he, like, three hours later, he posts underneath that, holy shit, no, that was just a thing, and there's, there's nothing right. else that you can say about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, there's... There, there's no, you can't, there's nothing. You cannot come up with a name for this thing. It's just a thing. It is a thing. That's all it was. It was, it was a thing. So I just thought that that was appropriate. He's like, oh, I'm going to come up with a better name. I'm like, I can't. And then, and then I started thinking, what would be a better name? Yeah, there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. So anyway, so who wants to go first? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, I already went first, so somebody else has to go. <laughs> okay, so I will go first. And I have two. And I was going to talk about La Llorona, but everybody knows about La, Do La Llorona, right? Or at least I know about my Sharona. Not your Sharona. No, La Llorona. Oh. <laughs> the weeping, the weeping yes, woman. Yes, yes, right? yes. Yeah, so everybody, and it's really funny because, you know, over in California, they have a variation of it. There's a variation of it in Mississippi that I found. Florida has has one as well. And in Puerto Rico, there's one too. So everybody has like a weeping woman type of thing going on. I'm pretty sure they did an X-Files on one too. Yeah, they did an X-Files on this one, which... Okay. I believe originated in Puerto Rico, and that is the Chupacabra. Yes. <laughs> I remember when X Files did that one. I refused to watch the show, and I was a big fan. I was watching. I watched almost every single episode except for that one. 
I refuse to this day. I refuse to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but legend goes that there was chupacabra. Literally means goat sucker. Yes. In Spanish, and a lot of people, a lot of my friends here that are next to the border in Mexico and everything said, "Oh no, that's a Mexican story. That was that was a Mexican story." I said, "Well, how far back does it go?" And they said, "Oh, we started hearing about it about 2000, 2001." And I'm like, "No, this one goes back to '95. I know because I remember when the because uh, I would get um, my dad would send me a well, he actually purchased for me the English equivalent of the biggest newspaper on the island." Like it, and it's published over here. So I would get it um, once a week. And I remember reading about the reports of livestock being found all over the island with puncture wounds and their blood completely gone. See, now and your I, timing with that actually coincides with that's when Art Bell started talking about them too. And I distinctly remember it being Puerto Rico, not Mexico. Yeah. Mexico yeah. was New Mexico was, or Mexico was later. Yeah, they get, I think it, it's traveling. It's like, you know, getting frequent flyer miles or something because it it went to Mexico and then it followed down south, you know, down to South America. Oh, the, but it it's is. Cre it's creepy you said that. Hang on, I get inappropriate. It's creepy you said that because I've always pictured the chup Chupacabra as the gremlin from the um, movie. Nightmare Twilight, no, the, the movie Twilight Zone. Yeah. John, Nightmare yeah. Three. Nightmare 3000 with John Lithgow. <laughs> See, I've always pictured the goat sucker as that. So when you said it's traveling, I said, well, that tracks. That, that's in my head canon. So. Okay, so so it, it, it tracks for you. And I think it does for me because, I mean, it's, um, it's a lot easier to fly to Mexico than to swim to Mexico. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, there's something out on the wing. Um, yeah, I'm... I, I can see this. I can see this. So, but yeah, that was, you know, when the report started coming out, we thought that there was uh, a satanic cult that had been doing that. And this is Puerto Rico. There's bound to be cults everywhere. I mean, we are some of the most histrionic people on the planet. <laughs> so, I'm glad you said it. it. I don't get, I, I am not even kidding. My, but, um, my first fiance was Puerto Rican, so yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. So yeah, you know. And Ordi knows. My first, my first wife was Cuban, so not that different. Yeah. No, Ordi knows Cuban. Yeah, same yeah. thing. We yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So so we thought that there, were, there was the possibility that there was um, some kind of a new cult or anything like that. It's very difficult for Satanists to actually get a foothold in Puerto Rico. It's very difficult. Uh, we're predominantly Catholic there, but it's not the Catholicism. It's people just don't put up with a the shit. They're like, no, uh-uh, this, this is not going to wash. We, just, we don't need this crap. In. We have enough you know, shit we got, to we, we, got, we got 17 different types of witchcraft here. We don't need... Exactly. You know, between hoodoo and voodoo and really spooky shit. And, you know, we got we Santeria even talk going on. Yeah. We got white witches. Uh, no. Yeah. They, they, they never really... I'm sure there are some, but they never really flourished. You know, they, they, never, um, they never established... Uh, a cult following. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, started wondering, well, is this a new cult that's coming along? Or they started investigating all of the practicing Santeria. Um, uh, doctors, for lack of a better term. <laughs> uh, they started asking, believe it or not, they started asking the white witches to help out with the investigation because they could not figure out who would want to do this to livestock and for what purpose? The only things that would make sense were a new cult or a, an established cult that was rather low key that nobody knew about. So that's why they used the white witches in order to get information and nobody could find out anything. And then reports started coming out from other people who started seeing this mysterious looking animal 
they described it at first as looking sort of like a kangaroo um, with glowing eyes. And I, what I mean by kangaroo is that it had a very long tail, it had a heavy set bottom part, and then the top was not as um, not as broad, you know, but it still had very long arms. And so, you know, somebody said, well, that sounds more like a, you know, a small Tyrannosaurus Rex or something like that. And they said, no, 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 wrong arms. Everybody, everybody went to the wrong <laughs> arms thing, you know. And so there were descriptions and most of them kind of floated along that same um, kind of a kangaroo-ish looking motherfucker. <laughs> So, uh, you know, they started asking people, it's like, you know, what did you see? And, you know, this one rancher said he came out when he heard a commotion. His chickens were, were spooked. He thought it might be um, a, a stray dog or something. So he goes out there to investigate and he saw this thing, you know, killing one of his um one of the, the small calves that he had. And, you know, he, it's very hard to get a gun in Puerto Rico. You actually have to be a member of a gun club. So he didn't have a gun. So he had a knife. <laughs> so he threw the knife, right, to get the thing, right? And then he goes for the machete. But, you know, the thing apparently got spooked and took off. And so he described it. And that has been circulating in Puerto Rico since 1995. They've ever actually caught a glimpse to, you know, close enough to describe this creature. But they, everybody says that it it does resemble a kangaroo-like creature that has kind of a scaly look to it. You know, like a giant lizard-looking kangaroo type of thing. And, um. Ever since 1995, mothers in every single town in Puerto Rico have used it to scare their children. How do I know this? Because <laughs> I have cousins that do it. <laughs> and to this day. If you, don't, if you don't come in before dark, the chupacabra will get the you. The chupacabra is going to get you. Oh, yeah. They, and they, they have no shame. No, none of my female cousins have any shame saying something like that to their children. None. They're like, you know, they, it's like, a, it's a weapon in their arsenal to be a good parent, I guess. But that has always spooked me. Even though I wasn't in Puerto Rico when that was taking place, I was following along with the reporting because, you know, I was getting the newspaper. And so, you know, my dad, you know, I called my parents every weekend. And when I talked to my mom, it was, Oh, you know, so and so is doing this, and so and so is doing that. And did you hear about so and so? And so and so got married, but this person came and broke up the the wedding party, and blah blah blah. And I mean, seriously, there's always some kind of drama going on with my family. And then I go talk to my dad. And during this time, that first, like, I think, I think all of 1996, every single Sunday that I talked to my dad, any more news on the chupacabra. And I would always ask him, Dad, please, 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 if this thing leaves Puerto Rico, please tell me. <laughs> because I was so afraid <laughs> that it was going to come over here. And, of course, it has. Because there are now reports all over, you know, south, uh, the southern part of the U.S. and Mexico and in Central America and further down that it has been sighted. So we don't know what it is. We have no idea what's going on. But weirdly, as the attacks ramped up over here in northern Mexico and in parts of Texas, they stopped happening in Puerto Rico. So what you're saying is this thing moved right around the same time you did. Oh, no, I was already <laughs> over here. Okay. I got here 76. Just, I was here I'm, already. I'm just I checking. transplanted myself. Early. I'm just checking. <laughs> but you my cousin was here. <laughs> You know what? It it always kind of, it, it just occurred to me, and being as interested in the chupacabras and everything I was through the you know through the height of its the the paranoia and the scare, 
it always seemed like a Wendigo found its way down to Puerto Rico. Oh, my word. Please don't say that. Sorry. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Especially with the description of when it was like, you know, that you know, it's got the distended belly and the gaunt kind of upper, you know, emaciated yes. upper body. Uh huh. So that, that kind of, that, that always calls Wendigo into my head. I, you know, that is one of the stories that we had to learn in uh, anthropology was the, all of the, um, Myths and legends of North America, yeah. uh, the major ones. And they, I mean, seriously, I you need three or four years to cover all the myths and legends for from every tribe. So we just sure. covered the major ones, and that was that was probably the biggest one. Um, we, we should have had you on when we did Wendigo and uh, the uh, Alaskan um, evil spirits. The evil spirits. <laughs> you should have had Courtney to do the Alaska ones. <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> but yeah, that I remember, you know, I never finished. Um, I started reading Pet Cemetery my sophomore year in college. I finished that book. Uh my sophomore year in college, by the way, was 1986-87. I finished that book in uh, 2004. <laughs> Because what is up with thing. King's stories? Like, no, that, that, mine was the opposite. I started Dark Tower in 1988, and I didn't finish it until the other books finally got released. Oh no! But for me, it wasn't. It, it, it wasn't that. You just never watched the movie. I I just I know I I was so spooked because it was the when they go okay, and I'm just like I. I know the stories. I know how they end. I don't want to read this book. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> and my teacher kept telling me, it's just fiction. Don't worry about it. It's fine. You don't have to that read it. But it's not real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was, uh, Wendigo is extremely creepy. And yet, you know, it's a very effective legend a very effective legend it it got shit done it you know it really you know, when rick and i did the uh when we were doing um north american um cryptozoology and myths and legend we did the wendigo that's actually the the deeper i dug into it the more i learned about it the creepier the fucking thing got and it was already creepy yeah it's it's um my um professor in in college the one who specialized in north american uh, cultures he had a beautiful collection of pottery from digs that he had acquired throughout his years either conducting digs uh, volunteering at digs you know being a professor you know all that stuff throughout the united states it was absolutely stunning he it was a small collection but they were all beautiful and they were all different. And his thing was, I just want one thing from this one culture, you know, and he would have it. And that was it uh, because he felt he didn't need a huge collection. The collections should be shared with the world, but he just wanted one piece of what he had contributed to bring to the world. So it was small. It was about 20 or 25 different clay pots, different sizes, the colors, the, the the techniques were all different and all that stuff. And I remember talking to him about uh, certain legends and everything. That is the one legend that he said he was still learning about. And this man at the time was nearing his um, retirement age. He had been a professor for almost 25 years. Uh, and um, yeah, he just, wanted to go ahead and enjoy life and everything, but that legend he was still learning about. It is so intricate and so involved that he actually, that's one of the things he never taught because he could not finish learning about it. You just can't. So it, he would glance, you know, he would just give you a once over in class about it. And he said, and he would tell you, I'm not going to put this on any test or anything, but you're more than welcome to start investigating on your own 
Learn about it on your own. It's and when you thing. retire, you may know more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it literally, it takes, it's a life's work to actually understand this particular legend because it's not just for one group of people. It actually did fan out so far and everybody has a different take and everything, but still it's a very deep legend. I mean, it's, it's very intricate. So, you know, and it's almost the same thing with uh, certain um, stories Egypt, in Egyptology, you know, the contentions of horrors and set. Everybody says, oh, it's just a story. I'm like, oh, dude, no, it's not just a story. I know people that are still studying that thing. It's a, it, it sounds like a story, but there's so many different channels that you end up going down. So, but it's not as creepy as when they go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that one takes the cake. <laughs> just... Ugh. I mean, it's got everything in it. Witchcraft, cannibalism. Everything. Everything and, bad that you've ever seen in a horror movie, it's in it. Yeah. In this one, yeah, spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just here trying to drink that out of my <laughs> of my of my brain. <laughs> Those of you in chat, do some Rick, I think we need to revisit Wendigo too. Yeah, probably. But Aggie, I don't think there's enough bourbon for that. Just, uh... I don't think so either. <laughs> All right, who's next? I brought a, I brought Chupacabra into the chat. Let's go. Okay. Well, okay. So Rick says he already went. I guess it's my turn. This one is actually a personal story. And those of you who have been listening for a while have heard me reference it at one point or another. But while I was working today, I was thinking, what am I going to bring to the Halloween table? And I did Robert Frost poem last year and it just kind of, you know, I, di I didn't really, because work has been so crazy, I didn't have time to drill down into doing what I wanted to do. And then I realized I have a personal experience that is, it's creepy to me and I hope it's creepy and Halloween-y to you. So cast back. It's 1995. Uh, Oingo Boingo was on their farewell tour. I had just seen them a few nights before at the Aladdin Theater in Vegas. I was living in Vegas at the time. And I was going to go see them at Universal Amphitheater on Halloween night for their final, 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 final concert of the tour. The last time they were going to appear live ever. Um, it's That was going to be on a Tuesday. So Monday night, I get off work. I'm racing home to go pack. I'm going to go stay with, sit with some friends in Costa Mesa. And I am hit by a drunk driver on the way home. Oh, my God. At the time, I was living out on eight miles of dirt road. Um, my dad and I had bought some land out, and we were developing it. He was he well, he wanted to retire and be a gentleman rancher, so uh, we were setting all that up. But it was out on eight miles of dirt road, and somebody had hit my passenger side with their passenger side, coming around a corner, and I was bleeding out. I hit the steering wheel and had severe contusions to my liver. I was bleeding out internally. Um, ambulance shows up much much later. I'm getting a ride to the hospital. I know the route and I know I am dying. Apparently I coded twice on the way to the hospital too, but I knew enough to know I was slipping away. I would constantly asking the driver, how far are we? And he would say, you know, we're at this. And I knew the route and he'd say, we're a mile mark of this. I said, okay, I'll try to hang on that much longer. Get to the hospital. Um, obviously I recovered. Um, then the time comes for the insurance to pay out you know, everybody involved, the doctors, the hospital and everything else. And then it goes to paying the ambulance company. Only two ambulance companies service the area. Neither of them have a record of picking me up that night. What? I remember, I remember every moment that I was conscious in that hotel with, or in that uh, ambulance with absolute clarity. I remember the, the three EMTs, I remember the voice of the driver. I remember all the conversation around the ambulance when they were losing me, when they would get me back, everything. I remember every moment that I was conscious in it. I could not tell you any of their names. The, nobody who else was on the scene, they remember the ambulance being there, but nobody remembers you know which company it was, which uh, fire department it came out of. And there was no record of me being picked up and delivered to the hospital. There is no record. None. 
And nobody, I mean, you'd think it'd be like, hey, you know what? We'd like to get paid too. But nobody, when, nobody, no, nothing ever hit collection. Nobody ever sent me a bill. When I'm divvying out the money, I called both ambulance companies and said, here's the date, here's my name, here's the time of the accident. I was transported to this hospital and here was the makeup of the crew. You know, we don't have any of those people. I'm, a, no, I'm, that, assuming, they there. I'm assuming you went through the ER. Yes. Right. The, you're right. And the ER, they said, yeah, you were dropped off and we processed you in. They gave us all your vitals and everything and handed you off. I said, which ambulance company was it? We don't have a record of that. And that, but that's so weird. I mean, dude, that's a miracle. That's not a ghost story. Yeah. <laughs> it's a freaking miracle. Because when I was in a, I was in a rollover accident in 2011. And uh, I was transported to the hospital via ambulance. And when I got there, you know, they had called ahead. ER was waiting outside. They got me off the gurney. And I was telling them, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm okay. It's like, you know, you were in a rollover. We need to make sure that your bones are fine. Your internal, intern, internal organs are fine, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. So I let them do their, you know, do their thing. And from where I was, I could see that the ambulance drivers were actually filling out forms for the hospital because the ambulances were not attached to the hospital. They're, you know, separate. Sure. So, I thought the same thing. But I could see them do it. You see what I mean? No, so, I know exactly. No, I know exactly. What you're talking. Even my attorney because I had to sue the insurance company. They said that I didn't have insurance. Not only did I have insurance, I had double insurance um, because on myself and also in the work vehicle that I was hit in. Um, even my attorney researched it, and he said, cannot find anybody who is going to cop to picking you up that night. That is incredible. That's not a ghost story. That's a miracle story for, like, our – December. Well, no, I mean, it still, <laughs> December it, show. It, it, it still counts as a ghost story because apparently it was a it ghost does. ambulance that saved his life. Yeah. Ghost ambulance. That's true. And you know what? Just because it's a ghost story doesn't mean that it's bad. It's usually some ghost stories are good ones. Well, the bad know? part is missing the final, 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 final Oingo Boingo. I mean, y'all know how I love Oingo Boingo. Missing the final, final concert. So that's the bad part of the story. But I was just, you know, I, I was just thinking, like, what, what can I bring to it? And that's actually what's funny is that back when Rick and I were talking about when getting starting juxtaposition, when you know he's, you know, we were when he, even when he was just spitballing, I said, yeah, I'd call in sometime and tell this story I just told. And Jody said, because I talked about it in uh, the green room, and Jody said, yeah, you absolutely have to get on and tell that story some night. And mm -hmm. it slipped my mind until today. I just. My well, God, so you literally are a living miracle. Well, the weirdest part yeah. about it slipping your mind until today is I we've already <laughs> we've already done a show we've already done a show like this once where I talked about how something pulled me into the middle of a pool and tried to drown me and it didn't even occur sure. to you then. <laughs> no, it didn't even occur to me on that one either. And that's just it's, and I've told this story many times on different shows without telling the whole story. You know, I've talked about how I was hit by a drunk driver and died twice on the way to the hospital, how I missed the Oingo Boingo concert because I got hit, but I've never actually told that whole part of it because it just, yeah. You'd be like, um, Ordy, um, we, we, wow. we, we're going to, we're going to set an appointment for you to talk to these people. We go, they, they go follow the guys in the nice white coats. Okay. <laughs> But yeah. so is, like I said, I, I mean, I, I remember the blue eyes of the female EMT. I remember the driver's voice distinctly. Every time I would say, what mile mark are we at? I mean, almost to the point where I think he got sick of answering it, but he knew that that was keeping me there. So, you know, kind of, but yeah, it was a 45 minute trip to the hospital. And yeah. That's wow. I'm, I'm, I'm a gog. I'm like, I have chills. All of my little arm hairs are standing up. Holy cow. That is incredible. I I got no words. I got nothing. <laughs> <clears throat> I... 
<clears throat> and being being the bar babe, you'll appreciate this too. When I was because, like I said, it was severe contusions to the liver. Um, right. It took a long time to recover. But finally, the doctor said, OK, you're you're free to live life as normal now because I couldn't lift over 50 pounds for a year and shit like that. I said, hang on a second. Let me explain to you what normal is. And he goes, <laughs> OK, you know what? Maybe you might want to just slowly ramp back up to that before you. Uh... <laughs> it was your liver after all. <laughs> yeah, Um but the liver is the most, the one that regenerates, the one yeah. organ that does regenerate. Well, skin to a certain extent, but the liver does regenerate. So, and it's there's funny, five though, whenever, lobes. Whenever I have to get an abdominal X-ray, the first thing the doctor will say afterwards is, "So, when did you damage your liver?" Yeah, they can it, still see the little scar on there from the. They, yeah, it'll scar. But it'll regenerate. They'll yeah. keep the scar. It doesn't. The scar doesn't go away. Right. You know, but you will grow another scar, lobe. So. So, yeah, they do inside and out. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Vic, you got one? <laughs> well, yeah, so I actually have a couple uh, that are also personal experiences within, honestly, about, I, I would say probably about eight or nine months of each other. Um, the first one was before my parents got divorced. You know, and it, and my, for those of you who don't know, my parents got divorced when I was in fourth grade, so I was like eight years old. So it was the summer before they divorced. Um, it was actually just a few weeks before. Um, and it was one of the rare nights that I talked to my parents about letting me stay out past the time that the, the you know, back, back in the day, that's better be in the house before the street lights come on or I'm going to get you. I, I managed to talk my dad and my mom into letting me stay out past the, because the street lights. And I, all my friends back then were at least three, four, or five years older than me. I'm just kind of how I roll. Kind of like now. I was just saying. <laughs> um, and, uh, so they're standing around telling ghost stories and everything else, and then finally my dad, about 30 minutes past the time the street lights came on, my dad finally pokes his head out the door. Boy, get your ass in the house. So I start coming to the house, and by then my dad's already gone inside. So I'm walking up the steps, and I remember suddenly feel like I'm, I feel like everything's in slow motion. I'm like, it feels like my feet are almost impossible to move. And I'm starting, to like, I'm starting to freak out. Then the hairs on the back of my neck stand up for some reason. At that point, I'm literally trying to do everything I can to get in the door. And as I, as I feel like I, it's like it's like the nightmare. You know when you have a nightmare and you're running, and it feels like you just can't move. It's exactly how it felt, yeah. except I was awake. It was really weird. Um, and then I remember feeling right as I finally got to the door and got it open. I felt something brush against my shoulder as I was walking through the door and closing it. I didn't sleep till like three o'clock that morning, and I never, I didn't tell my parents or anything. So that's the first one. And then, um, so my parents got divorced. I think it was. I'm trying to remember exactly when it was, because this happened right after they got divorced. So my mom puts me in the Y because because I never could I didn't learn how to swim. My dad tried. My dad tried the same way his dad tried to teach him how to swim. Took me out on the boat, threw me in the water, and said, "You're gonna fucking swim or else." And I apparently chose or else. <laughs> so my dad had to dive in and save me. So my mom puts me in swimming lessons at the YMCA that was down the street from her house. And so we're doing the we're. We're doing our kicking exercises in the deep water. So back then we had the little stupid fire styrofoam boards for people that couldn't swim yet. And I was hanging on to mine. So my legs were getting tired. So I asked uh, the instructor if I could go ahead and go back over to the shallow end. And she's like, yeah, we're almost done. Go ahead and go over there. So I, I paddle my way back over to the shallow end. And I'm just goofing off in the shallow end over by the edge of the pool. All of a sudden it, it, something literally grabs a hold of me. So I start looking around thinking somebody's messing with me, right? There's nobody behind me, and I'm being, I, I can literally feel myself, and keep in mind, this is a pool. It's, there's, no, there's no current. It's not a lake. It's not, a, it's not the ocean. So I'm being pulled from the side of the pool. The last thing I remember was feeling like I was being turned upside down. I remember looking up from underneath the water and seeing my feet sticking out of the water. The next thing I remember is being woke up by an EMT giving me mouth to mouth and my mom freaking out. Something in my old neighborhood was trying to kill me. What just, the just, hell? Just, just saying. 
And you can tell they weren't cool about it because it was an EMT and not like Wendy Peppercorn. <laughs> Holy crap. I mean, I, y'all, I'm going to have to sleep with all the lights on tonight. <laughs> Wait, why, why do you think I? Why do you think I didn't tease you when you said all the lights were on? <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna be so freaked out. <laughs> why do I do this to myself? I'm not a big horror freak, and yet, you know, I always sign up. Oh yeah, that's the ghost stories. Sure. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> you could find out that two of the people you know have actual ghost stories, and it could freak you out even more. Mm-hmm. I actually have one, but, you know, it was something that I witnessed with my grandma. My grandmother, um, my paternal grandmother, <clears throat> she was born in 1903. And uh, the house that she and my grandfather uh, bought was downtown in our hometown. And it was, you know, it was made of wood and it had the very tall ceilings and the louvered doors and the transom lights and all that stuff, right? Um, so it was very 19th century looking, um, that kind of thing. But anyway, because it was wooden, there were termites all over the place. And so it had to be raised and rebuilt. What I didn't know at the time was that the first time that house was built, it had been built on the grounds of another house that had burned down previously. But nobody in my family told me anything about that. I just happened to find it when I was looking at some stuff that my grandmother wanted me to file away. And I found out about the other house, the previous house to the previous house to the current house. Um, anyway, so I asked my grandmother about it. I must've been about 16 at the time I was visiting and, uh, she said, oh yes, that was the house that belonged to this particular family. And, um, the, the house caught fire and most of the family made it out, but the father died trying to, uh, save his children. Ooh. And I was like, really? Oh my God, that's so sad. It's like, yeah, it was a, it was very sad. You know, eventually the, you know, the, the, some of the family members still live in town and everything. And, uh, you know, and she talks to them and, and whatnot. What I didn't know is that it wasn't until later that my grandmother confessed to me that this, she believes that the spirit of the dad still lives there protecting her because she lived alone. And at the time, my grandmother was, I want to say she was in her 80s, maybe late 70s, early 80s. And so she and she was not a very strong woman, but she lived in a two-story house that was made out of concrete. There were no rugs, right? So one day, she is uh, coming down from upstairs. And she slips on the stairs and falls down. Um, down the stairs and uh, she got up and she's telling me this story. It's like, I got up. It felt almost like nothing happened. Like I was cushioned the entire way down. And, but she decided to get checked up anyway. And so she walked to the doctors and the doctor checked her over. She had a bruise on her forehead and that was all. And he asked her, you know, do you want me to do x-rays? And she said, yes, I just want to make sure. Bones were fine. Everything was fine. And she's telling me later, you know, she says, I felt cushioned all the way because Santiago was protecting me. Santiago was the name of the, the dad. And I was like, how can you be sure? And she says, nothing has ever happened to me in this house. Ever. I have slipped and I have not broken anything. I'm, I, did, she started counting off the times that she has slipped and has fallen. Um, things have uh, broken and fell on her. Um, 
everything. And she says, every single time something has protected me. And, you know, I asked my dad about it. And my dad said, yeah, your grandma believes that, but I don't. And I'm like, well, then how do you explain this and this and this and that? He says, I don't, but I don't think about it either. So whatever. <laughs> He's very pragmatic. He's like, if I don't have a... That's, that's you know, just whistling past the graveyard. Yeah, pretty much. That's my dad. So anyway, my grandmother passed away uh, in 99. And my cousin bought the house from my parents. Um, and uh, she was telling mom that she was feeling very uncomfortable in the house. And my mom was like, and my mom is there in Puerto Rico. And, and she's like, what are you talking about? She's like, I don't think, I don't feel comfortable in this house. I don't think I belong here. And my mom she just takes a deep breath and just says, and she said in Spanish, in Spanish, she says, Santiago, it's okay. She's my niece. She just bought the house. It's fine. And my cousin tells my mom that she felt like this warmth go through her completely. And she felt so at peace. And then it was, it was over. And after that, it was fine. The house was fine. It was, she was able to live there and she lived there for quite some time before they sold the house and moved to San Juan or whatever. But I was just like, uh, so mom believed it. My dad was like, yeah, no. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> we had a ghost here the whole time. And apparently once my mom said, you know, it's okay. She's, she's my niece. Everything's fine. It was almost like she was releasing Santiago from the burden of keeping somebody else safe type of thing, you know? And, um, yeah, my cousin said that nothing, you know, she, she didn't feel anything after that. Everything was fine. And I said, well, when your kids fell, did they fall and hit hard? Oh, yeah. A couple of them broke bones and everything. Yeah, so he was gone. So he managed to be at peace enough that he was able to leave, in my opinion. And that was the closest I ever came to an actual ghost story that I kind of sort of witnessed, you know. So not really. But it was kind of neat. It was a benevolent one, which is why I like. That's it. a great story. Yeah. Well, you had a benevolent one too, so so that was kind of cool. It's not like, everything is not everything is death. Well, I mean, even when it's death, not everything is negative. Right. Right. Well, there some and sometimes a negative actually turns into a positive. There's I don't know if you all have ever heard of. Um, the the uh, the legend of the uh, haunted railroad tracks in San Antonio. Uh huh. And what? It, so you've heard of it, right? Oh or yeah, no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's about the little kids. A bus actually stalled on railroad tracks, and uh, a train was coming, and it was rounding a bend, and it's it's on the south side of uh of san antonio and it's a the you know it's not a straight um so the train didn't see the bus there it turned the corner the bus was right there and it was too late for the train to stop and um the all of the children died and people swear up and down that the kids are still there to make sure that no cars get stalled on those railroad tracks. And some people have actually said, I will park the car in neutral on the railroad tracks and leave it. And it will roll away. It will roll. And the thing is, the tracks are not on a downward, you know, slope. They're on an upward slope. So it's really weird to see the car being rolled at an angle upward and some people actually put talk on the on the bumpers and do that and when they go get their and the, and the car doesn't keep going 
the car just rolls long, you know, away enough to clear the railroad tracks, like maybe 10, 15 feet, and that's it. And then it stops. And they go get their car, and they see little handprints on the top that they had put on the uh, the bumpers. It's kind of creepy. I mean, I, I, I know people that have done this, and they said, yes, we did it, and that happened, you know. And it's to the point where there's always a police presence in the area to make sure that nobody is doing stupid stuff like that because of the, you know, the train comes around the corner, it'll hit the car, you know, but you know, some people, and it has, and it, and it, and it always happens um, during school hours. You know, yeah. This, this has been covered on, um, I remember seeing it in both in search of and unsolved mysteries. Yeah. And especially the talc parts. And yeah, it's the, the handprints are there. And the handprints are there. And it's really, it, people just freak out over this. They're like, we can't understand it. And I'm like, well, you know, apply Occam's razor. Well, you know what? Occam's razor tells me, yeah, those are the little kids are still ha- trying to help you. Yeah. That's what it tells me. And the, there. there's no other explanation that I can think of outside of that. So, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a negative that, is kind of a positive, you know, um, there's the, there's like, I, like I said, the La Llorona, there's so many different takes on the weeping woman, but there is one that is actually a positive one where she had lost her children and she, whenever child, whenever children are near, she, you, she, she hear, they hear the, the crying. So the kids are spooked away from the river. She's trying to protect them. She's trying to make sure that they're not, in the water. So, you know, it just depends on who's telling the story, I guess. Yeah. Which version really? (laughs) Yeah. All right. So any other stories that anybody wants to share? (laughs) Well, I do have, I do actually have a short local one too. Uh, This one is called, uh, this is dead woman's crossing. It's in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Uh, This is actually, uh, a murder mystery story from the 1900s around here. Uh, so according, and this was written uh, in the Atlas Obscura, uh, in the early 1900s in Weatherford, Oklahoma, Katie DeWitt James left her home with her baby after she filed for divorce from her husband. She planned to move in with her cousin, but her family never heard from her. After an investigation, it turned out that she moved in with local prostitute Franny Norton. She was last seen leaving the house with Franny and her child in a carriage. Franny returned sometime later with the child, who also happened to be covered in blood, but without Katie. Her body was found later along a nearby creek with her head cut off. It was rumored that her ex-husband had actually killed Franny and hired the prostitute to help. However, she swore she wasn't involved in Katie's death. But on the day that she was supposed to be questioned by the police, she poisoned herself. Apparently, Katie's still around, though. She allegedly appears as a blue light floating around town, and people have reported hearing a woman looking for her baby and the rolling sound of carriage wheels. Oh. You're welcome, That's Maggie. tragic. <laughs> That's awful. Oh, God. I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> This happens every Halloween. I'm not sleeping tonight. I can tell. That's 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 really sad. Yeah. Very sad. I don't like sad ghost stories. I like happy ghost stories, like your ghost story, Ordy. That one was a good happy ending story. <laughs> well, I mean, the happy ending, everything that had happened through it was sucked. Yeah, true. But you know, but yeah, you know, the, the ghost ambulance that so- still freaks me out. So, and just can't, uh, and like I said, it's just, it's like I said, I talked about it years ago when we started, you know, when Rick was spitballing, hey, what would you guys think of like, you know, what eventually became Jux? And, you know, me saying, yeah, I could totally tell the story. And Jody saying, yeah, you have to. And then for years, not telling the whole story until tonight. That's, it's just weird that, you know, being pressed for a contribution. Well, not even, you know, just couldn't come up with a contribution that, really jumped out at me until I was driving at work and said, Hey, you know what? Why not tell my story? It's so, a hell of a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. 
So yours so, and Rick's. <laughs> so con contractually, I have to do this now because Aggie said happy endings. Giggity, 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 <laughs> let's have sex. I, 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 can't, I can't hear happy ending without thinking of the time I had to explain to artist Angie. Angie. Oh, no. What a happy, yeah. Because <laughs> okay, we used to be in a DM together, and you know, whenever she's like, I, I, I'm, the, I, I'm the innocent whisperer. Okay. You know, it's like whenever she'd see something out in the wild on Twitter, she'd, have, she'd come into the DM and say, hey, Ordy, what does this mean? I'm like, Ugh, okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I actually do message the person who every every so often there's there'll, there'll be a reference, and I don't understand it, and so I will message that person and say, "Look, I don't want to look stupid, so can you help me out here? What do you mean by that?" And they'll explain it, and it's like, "Oh, thank you." And most of the time, I'm like, "Girl, you're 56. How do you not know this?" And I'm like, "I live a sheltered life. Okay? I'm a sheltered 56." I'm literally doing cleaver here. <laughs> Ooh, so, and I bought a cleaver today, so I'm kind of excited. So <laughs> wait, you're, you're, so just to make sure, you you just admitted that you like pearl necklaces. Oh, God, <laughs> that was one I did ask now about. I'm gonna, <laughs> now, now, I'm, now I'm going to have to explain that one. <laughs> I actually did have to reach out and ask somebody what that meant. I Thank you, know. Urban Dictionary. <laughs> yeah, there's only one time I really have to do that. Is sometimes an obscure meme will come across my feed, and it abs and I can absolutely tell that it originated from the left. I mean, sometimes you know they do have some good memes, not rare, but often. So I have to reach out to uh, my Canadian socialist friend. I said, "Okay, man, get on your Facebook Bernie Dank meme stashes and parse this one out for me." It's just too obscure for me then he'd come back and be like yeah that's not even funny well no it's not funny but <laughs> <laughs> but now you laugh about it <laughs> yeah and then and then we laugh about how bad it is so <clears throat> okay so you know what okay um I, I do have to break the tone for just a second because this just came across my feed and it's fucking amazing um Lionsgate is moving forward with their Highlander reboot from John Wick director Chaz Solinsky starring Henry Cavill. What? I just ovulated. What? $100 million oh, budget. Wow. Okay. The, the... Henry Cavill. Cavill. Oh, my God. As I... Colin McGregor. My ovaries exploded. <laughs> Colin McLeod. McGregor's the box. Colin McLeod. Please do not fuck this up. Please do not fuck this up. Please do not fuck this well, up. Well, I mean, I don't know. Like you got John Wick's director and you got Cavill. How can it go bad? Uh, listen. Uh, I don't want to jinx it. Please, please see. There which, was a please time. See which there was a time. Two. <laughs> you know, and you remember this. There was a time where Nick Cage was slated to be Superman. Yes. And Tim Burton was going to direct. Kevin Smith was going to be one of the writers. Yeah, it was a big, big to do. Brian, hundred percent uh, fan service, huh? That would have been one hundred percent fan service. Uh, I would have, honestly, I would have paid bank to see that movie be made. It would have been glorious, but it didn't even come to fruition. So you can never tell. You can never tell. You know. But yeah, I'll. I, man, I've watched. This is coming out from Bounding into Comics uh, sourcing deadline. He was Henry Cavill was the only reason I watched the Tudors, because that was so annoying to me from an historical perspective. That show was just that series just made me want to like grind my teeth every single time. But it, it, he was in it, so it, I would watch it. It wasn't about the it wasn't about the history, Aggie. It was about the boobs. <sighs> Well, yeah, you know, this, and, and Natalie this, Dormer's were real and spectacular. I'm not yeah, gonna lie, <laughs> as we all learned in Game of Thrones too. But uh, no, I mean, you know, you know, the Tudor sequel was pretty good. I think it was the Four Doors. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a nerd. And I'm like, uh huh. Oh. oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> that joke. 
Actually, that was a Steve Martin joke. That was from L.A. Story. And over there we have a two-door oh. mansion, and over there we have a four-door mansion. That is one of the greatest satires ever done, in my opinion. Yeah. It really is. So understated. So understated. He is such a great writer. I love reading his stuff. Anyway, yeah. so we're up against the clock, so I guess we better start winding it up. Rick, where can we find you? Uh, do we have to start with me? We'll be here till next week. Anyway, uh, you can find me tomorrow night. We are on week three of a four-week Juxtober. Uh, Juxtober will wind up bleeding over into November because we had to take a week off. Um, so I'll be doing that with the Amish one tomorrow night. And then I believe I may actually have... When did you and Jeff start your uh, your book show again? Was that next week? We're doing it on November 6th is the launch. Okay, mm -hmm. good. I was afraid I was about to step on something because I may have a pop-up show happening on Monday again, so I may be doing something Monday night. Then Tuesday, uh, we'll be doing the uh, the whatever show with Stacy, and then doing Jen and Rick. And then Wednesday is the start of... Wait, 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 wait. Tuesday is cocktail lunch. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. You're right. So we don't do that one anymore. So it's Loftus first, <laughs> then Cocktail Lounge. Sorry, I was already jumping to Thursday for some reason. And then Wednesday is, uh, well, actually, it's going to be the kickoff of the morning show, the Rick Robinson Show. And then later that night, I'll still be doing America Off the Rails, producing for the Conservative Curmudgeon, producing for the Red Wine, and then finishing the night off with Rick and Orty. Then Thursday, which is where I was a second ago for some reason, We'll be doing the whatever show with Stacy, and then doing Jen and Rick, and then back around here again. When I'm not doing all that, you can find me on the Rocky. Loftus Party and also on Twitchy. And on oh, social so media, morning, Rowdy Rick 73. It, it, is the morning show going to be every morning? Monday through Friday. Okay. Good to know. Because I'm insane. <laughs> <laughs> Where can folks find right. you? Where can folks find Who? you? Me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at Aggie Rican and at Aggie the Barky. Those are over on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Uh, you can find me 8.30 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday nights, doing the Cocktail Lounge with my ever suave co-host, Brad Slager. Friday nights, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, doing He Said, She Said with, right now, with uh, with Rick. Um Hoping that Mickey's schedule gets to be a little lighter soon. But uh, I know he's got quite a bit on his plate right now. So, but we're pulling for him. And once a month, this past month, this past Wednesday, we did it, right? Toxic masculinity yeah. with the guys, G, Ordy, and Rick. So, it, last Wednesday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern. What about you, Ordy? Ah, where am I this week? Okay, so tomorrow night, as Rick mentioned, we are doing uh, Juxtober, where we continue our uh, deep dive into this year, which is in witchcraft. And um, as he said, we will be spilling over one week also because we both sucked at life a couple weeks ago. And thank you so much for joining us last week. I actually got comments. Is there anything she isn't brilliant about? So no. the, answer, out. the answer is no. no. Seriously, <laughs> there, there's absolutely the nothing is, she's not brilliant about. Then on uh, Tuesday, we'll be on the uh, Manorama panel. Um, on Wednesday, Rick and I will be doing Rick and Ordy. Thursday this week, uh, I have the culture shift with entertainment writer Brad with the great hair. And then back around Saturday to do the Juxtober. Uh, you can also find me as Ordnance Packer on Twitter. Yes, I know I've been sucking at life with my 31 days of Oingo Boingo this year. My work schedule has been absolutely insane. I will get completely caught up this weekend and uh, because I actually do have two, count them, two consecutive days off. And then, um, yeah, that's it. Fuck. Sounds busy. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, well, what sucks is that, you know, I, I was actually intending this month to start formulating and doing a proto version of my standalone podcast. And I just don't have fun. Cause I was going to use that with the 31 days of Boingo Boingo to kind of give the tone of what the show is. And yeah. So best laid plans of mice and men here. Yeah. Or he so, was like, or he speaking, was like... speaking of oh, um, obscure, little obscure, little bit of a uh, trivia that I just lost. <laughs> 
So uh, the line in uh, Dead Man's Party, Room for Just One More, that is actually from a short story and was also used in the Twilight Zone episode 22. 22. And the, story, <laughs> and, and the, uh, the short story is The Bus Conductor by E.F. Benson. There's always room for one more, honey. Yep. <laughs> God, that creeped me out so much. <laughs> and she was stunning. Not going to lie. Absolutely. Total smoke show. All righty. Well, thanks so much, guys, for uh, joining me for some ghost stories and some not so ghostly stories. <laughs> thanks for joining us, everybody. We hope you have a great weekend and stay tuned next, what, Saturday for the juxtaposition? Yep. Is that the only show yep. tomorrow? tomorrow? Yeah. Figured it was only appropriate that we went out with Nightmare on Elm Street since Aggie's not going to be sleeping. Of course. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. See, no, you're supposed to go out with tubular bells. <laughs> well, you didn't send me my memo, sir. So. <laughs> <laughs>